So you plug in an integer for that, and then you get a, a, a polynomial equation in the remaining unknowns. And you ask whether it's solvable. And so, the, I mean, the answer, whether it's solvable or not, will depend on what, which integer you plug in, A. And if you take the set of values of A for which the, the polynomial equation is solvable, then any set that, that's going to be some subset of integers, and any set that arises that way will be called diffinity. So, um, yeah, so, well, maybe, actually, maybe before, yeah, so um, here's one example. So if you take the set of non-negative integers, that's a Diophantine set, and here's the polynomial that does it. Um, so if you ask for which value, for which integers A, can you find integers x1 through x4 that solve the equation? Well, you know Lagrange's four squares theorem, then you know that those are that it's solvable if and only if A is greater than or equal to zero. And let me, let me also draw, there, there's a geometric way of thinking about what this notion of diaphantine means. So if I, if I plot m plus one dimensional space where I have this is the t axis and, and this is the everything else axis, then you can, you, can, you, can, you can take the polynomial p of tx and it'll define some hypersurface in, in, in m plus one dimensional space. And then, you, if you take the integer points that lie on that hypersurface, and you project them down to the t-axis, so then you'll get some, some set of integers down here. And if you take that, those, those, that, that subset of the integers, then that, that's, 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 the exact, that's, the, that's what, that, that's a diaphantine set. That, that's, that's just geometrically what it means. So it's, it's essentially all things you can get by taking integer points on, on some hypersurface and projecting them onto one coordinate. Okay. So, all right. So, okay, so that's one notion. So that's, so that's sort of a number theoretic notion. And there's also a, a computability theory notion that's called listable. So this is a, it's also called com uh, computably enumerable. Or in the old days it was called recursively enumerable. Okay. All right. So this. Uh, so, so a set is listable if you can write, if you can write a computer pro, if, if yeah, if there's a computer program, essentially a Turing machine, that prints out that subset when you let the program run forever. So an example would be the set of prime numbers, because if you, well, if you know how to program at all, you probably know how to write a program that prints out the prime numbers. And I mean, here's another example, going back to what I had on the first few slides. If you take the set of integers that are expressible as a sum of three cubes, that's listable. That, now that doesn't mean I can actually test whether a given integer is the sum of three cubes, but you can list them all by, by doing this process where you first loop over all the x, y, and z's in some box. You print out all the things you get from those. Then you repeat with a larger box, the size of 100, and then you print out all the x cubed plus y cubed and z cubes that come out of those. And you just keep going like that. And eventually, if, if a number is a, a sum of three cubes, it will eventually be printed out by that computer program. But it's not a very useful program because you don't know. I mean, if you, if you run the program for a while and you don't see 33, you don't know whether it's going to be coming later. So, so I mean, so in other words, it's, if you, just because a set is listable, it doesn't mean that you have a, an algorithm to decide membership. So you, you might not, even if, I mean, this set is listable, but I don't know if there's, an algorithm to decide whether a given integer that will, that given an integer will decide in fine time whether that integer belongs to the set or not. Uh, for this particular set, actually, I believe that there is there is probably an algorithm, and be, uh, that's because it seems, although this is not proved, that the set of integers that are expressible as the sum of three cubes are exactly the integers that are not plus or minus four or mod nine. And I know how to write a program to test that. <laughs> so, so, okay, but I, I just want to say, and actually, there, there, um, there are some listable sets that are so complicated that there is that there is no algorithm to decide membership. So this is related to the uh, undis the unsolvability of the halting problem. And so, uh, yeah, okay. So now I'm, I'm I'm ready to state what what these four authors, Davis, Butler, Robinson, and Matusiewicz, what they really proved. And what they really prove is that these two classes of subsets of integers are the same. So the, 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 the sets that arise as, as parameter values for which is a, a Diophantine equation or a polynomial equation is solvable, those are exactly the same sets that you get 
that, that, that can be listed by, by a computer program. So, I mean, one way is sort of easy to show, if you have a diophantine set, you can write a program that will print it out, essentially using the same trick I had for the sum of three cubes. And then you, you print, you, you find all the integer points on the hypersurface in a big box, you print out all their projections, and then you repeat for a larger and larger box, and eventually you'll print out all the, all the elements of your, the, all, all the parameter values for which it's, it's solvable. But the, 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 the amazing part of this theorem is the other way. So if you have any listable set, like the set of prime numbers, this is saying that there's going to be some polynomial equation. There's going to be some hypersurface here, such that when you take the integer points, for example, you can make, you can make it so that the projection is, are exactly the prime numbers. So, um, yeah. And actually, there, the, if you look at their proof, um, I mean, to, they sort of, in order to prove something like this, you sort of have to simulate you have to simulate the behavior of any Turing machine by, by, by diophantine equations. And so if you look at the, I mean, if you have a big computer program, usually you, you imagine, you look, you look into it, you see all the little, sub, it's calling subroutines and so on, and those subroutines call littler subroutines and so on. And their proof it sort of looks, it has the sort of same sort of structure. You prove little number theory lemmas, and then those get used to prove bigger number theory lemmas. And then you sort of, you sort of, you sort of, you sort of Copy, you, yeah, so you, so you, yeah, so you sort of, you simulate a universal Turing machine by, by, by Diophantine equations. Okay, I'm not going to be able to go into the proof of that. It, it's, it's sort of a, I mean, it's, it's not a, it, it, there's nothing, I mean, it's all elementary in some sense, but it, it, it's, it's a long, it's a long, it's a long proof. Okay, but let me explain why this now answers, uh, why this gives a negative answer to this Hilbert Sand problem. So first, we use this result from computability theory or from logic that there exists a listable set that for which there's no way to decide membership. And the unsolvability of the halting problem does that. For example, I mean, so the halting problem is the problem where you want to, the, the halting problem asks whether there's, you can write a debugger that will take as input a computer program and a, po a possible input and decide whether when you run that program on the input, whether it will halt or not. And it's known, it's known that, that, that's, that there, is no algorithm, there is no such debugger that can, I mean, it will halt instead of entering some infinite loop. And it's known there's no algorithm that will decide that problem. And so if you know that, then from that you can, de you can deduce the existence of, of one of these listable sets. You can, it, the listable set will be essentially be the, the codes of the, of the, of the program comma input. You can encode those as integers and take the set of such pairs that halt. And then that'll be something you can list because you can sort of run all the programs in parallel at, at once. I mean, you can, there's this trick in computer science where you run, you run, you spend, you have one processor, but you let that processor spend half its time on the first program, one quarter of its time on the next program, <laughs> one eighth of its time on the next program. <laughs> and so eventually, if, if any, any of them that halt, you will know it eventually, <laughs> and so and then and when it halts, you just print out the, that computer that program's number, and then so in this way you can print out all of the all the pro the, all the programs that halt. But uh, yeah, I mean it's not a very efficient algorithm. But also, the, the, what, what's even worse is that there's you can't t it's, it's like the sum of three cubes. You can't tell if I if I tell if I ask you about a particular program, there's no way to decide necessarily whether that one will halt. You just have to wait and see if. It, yeah, so anyway, so yeah, so it's proved that, that there is no, yeah, so that, that's how you can form, you can, you can create a listable set for which there's no algorithm that can decide membership. And once you have that, and if you know this theorem, then that same set is a diophantine set for which you cannot decide membership. So what does that mean? I mean, so you have a, you have a diophantine set, so it's the, you have, some, you have some polynomial equation depending on a parameter. And to say that you can't decide whether an integer belongs to the set means that you cannot decide for which parameter values the equation is solvable in integers. And so that means that even in this one parameter family of Diophantine equations, you don't have an algorithm to decide which ones are solvable or which ones are not. So if you can't even decide this one parameter family, then you certainly can't solve the full Hilbert percent problem, because that's asking about all polynomial equations. 
So actually, so this actually this proof shows that not only is the, the, the general Hilbert's temp problem unsolvable, but it's even unsolvable if you if you look at polynomials of a fixed degree and a fixed number of variables. Well, as long as the degree and the number of variables are big enough. I mean, I, you can solve polynomial equation of degree one. You can decide whether one of those have interest in it. And it turns out that there's a more complicated algorithm that looks for degree two. For any quadratic forms, you can decide whether they have integer solutions. But yeah, but in, but in general, there, there's going to be some, some number. Actually, 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 there's a trick where you can, you can reduce any polynomial equation to a polynomial equation of degree four. It's, like, it's, it's really easy. Maybe I can explain it later if you want to see it. But it's, it's sort of a stupid trick to, to that all. But anyway, so there's. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so this, this gives the, ne the negative answer to Hilbert's 10th problem. So that, as, as an almost immediate consequence of this, of this theorem and, well, and a little bit of logic, the unsolvability, unsolvability of the ultimate problem. All right, so, so that's one. So, okay, so, so this, the, Hilbert, the negative answer to Hilbert's 10th problem is one of the applications of this. Um, let me now move to this uh, next part of my talk, which is some more um, fun consequences of this same theorem. So one is to uh, uh, call time-producing polynomials, and the other is has something to do with Riemann hypothesis. But it's, well, it's not, it, this is not going to be much less deep than it sounds. Uh, you'll see when I when I get to it. All right, let me start with the time-producing polynomials. So, so here's a polynomial in 26 variables, a, b, c, d, e, to z. So and this polynomial, the claim is that this polynomial has the property that when you let the 26 variables run over all non-negative integers. And you look at all the possible outputs, all, all the possible values that you get out of this polynomial. And then you throw away all the negative ones. And you also throw away net zero. Then what remains is, a, is exactly the set of prime numbers. And, well, I mean, I'm not going to prove that for you here. But I mean, yeah, you, can, you can see a little bit about the structure of this polynomial if you look carefully. I mean, it, well, first of all, one interesting thing about this polynomial is that it factors. There's a factor k plus 2 here. And then there's another big factor here. And this other big factor, I mean, you might think, oh, if, 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 it's a, if it factors, I mean, how is this ever going to be prime? I mean, in order for this to be prime, well, k plus 2 is at least, uh, is at least 2. So the only way this could ever be prime is if the second factor is 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 is, is one or minus one, but, and in fact, actually it have to be one because this is pol this is positive. This k plus two is positive. And in fact, the, and the only way this whole thing can be one, if you look at this carefully, this is actually one minus a, bu a bunch of a sum of squares. So so the, most of the time this 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 thing is negative. And so very, it has to be, it's very special things have to happen in order for this to even be positive. And somehow, and this is the part I'm not going to explain, one, for all these squares to be zero, somehow that forces k plus 2 to be prime. And so that's the, but I mean, where does this come from? I mean, you take, I mean, how do you get a polynomial like this? You, you, you just look at, you look into the proof of the DPRM theorem. You know that the set of prime numbers is a listable subset. And the DPRM theorem lets you, convert the program that prints out the prime numbers into a Diophantian equation that has the same, that has the same behavior. And then, and then, well, this is, this, is what you, this is what you get. Actually, I think they did a little bit of simplification to get down to this, but, but yeah. And actually, you can do it with less than 26 variables. I think it's gotten down to, I can't remember, maybe 9 or 11 or something like that. But I think, but I think if you have fewer variables, the, it gets bigger and bigger. So this is, this is somehow sort of optimal in that you have enough letters, and also it fits on the slide. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So that's one application. And there's, and uh, yeah, and there's nothing special about the prime numbers here. I mean, you could take your favorite listable set. You could take the set of numbers of the form two to the n plus three to the n, and then there would be a similar polynomial whose output, whose positive, such the positive values in the output would be exactly those numbers. So yeah. All right. So. All right, so that, that's, okay, let me move on to the second application. So this is the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, I mean, this doesn't prove the Riemann hypothesis or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> but, okay, so what is the Riemann hypo hypothesis, first of all? So let me just remind everybody. So you have, you have this, uh, you, have a, you, have a mer well, you have a complex function, a function of a complex variable s, and it's defined by this series. 
and it converges for a uh, real part of s greater than, greater than 1. So, okay, so here's a complex plane. So, okay, here's 1. And, well, I guess the thing in calculus, you call this the p-series test or something. Yeah, so it converges over here. And, um, well, uh, and although it doesn't converge here, you can analytically continue it. You can go around the singular. There's, there's a pole of one, and you can, you can, and it extends to an analytic function on the complement of one. And the question is about the zeros of the function. And it's known that it has zeros at, at, at the negative even enters, and minus two, and minus four is one. And it's known that all the other zeros are somewhere in this strip between real part zero and real part one. <coughs> And, there's also, and the, the, the zeta function also has a, has a symmetry, the functional equation, that's sort of symmetric around one half. And, and, the, and the, the conjecture, the Riemann hypothesis, is that all the other zeros are on the, on sort of the line, the, the sort of symmetric line, where the, where the real part is a half. So, and, well, people have checked it up to whatever, 10 to, I don't, I don't know, maybe 10 to 12 or something, I don't remember exactly. But. It looks like all the zeros are there. But. All right, and so, um, so what is what is now what what is this what does Davis Putnam Robinson Montesavich theorem have to do with it? Well, not very much, but but it, what it lets you do is it lets you write down a particular polynomial equation such that if if that such that the Riemann hypothesis is false if and only if that polynomial equation has a solution in integers. Now, how do you make such a thing? Well, you just first you find a if, I mean, the, only thing, the only thing I need to know about the Riemann hypothesis is that you can write a computer program that can search for counterexamples. And there, there are lots of ways of doing it. There are a lot of uh, equivalent versions of, of, the, of the Riemann hypothesis that you can check. Or you can just do something sort of naive. You can start, start writing down rectangles, to say, with just write down countably many rectangles and start searching for zeros of this function here using the argument principle. You can just do, you know, integrate whatever it is. Say that. You can just do these integrals over all these rectangles to count how many zeros there are in each rectangle. I mean, you might have problems if there's a, there happens to be a zero right on the boundary. But I mean, most of the, but it's okay. You only, you, it suffices to check the countably many rectangles with, with rational Gill and imaginary parts as their coordinates, and you can just run them all, implement all of them in parallel, searching for counterexamples. And you're using the trick I've had before, where you, you have a half time on each rec, uh, first rectangle, a quarter time. And if, if there is a zero somewhere, then there's going to be some there's going to be some rectangle that contains it, and that, that doesn't have any other zeros on the boundary. And so that, that rectangle will eventually discover. You'll you'll compute this numerically, and you'll find that it's it's closer to one than to any other integer. And so you know that. So you, you can okay. Anyway, there are lots of ways you can write a computer program to search for counterexamples. And so once you have that, you just convert it into a Diophantine equation with the property that that Diophantine equation. Has a, has, a, has an integer solution if and only if this program halts with its counterexample. And so then, well, all you have to do is figure out. You, okay, see, so, I mean, you could actually write down this. I don't know if anybody's actually done it, but you could actually write down this particular polynomial equation over the integers. And then all you have to do is start searching for integer solutions, or, or, or you could try to, or maybe you get lucky. Maybe there's no solutions mod 7. If that's true, you would have just proved the Riemann hypothesis. But I mean, I don't think that this particular polynomial equation has that property. I think the kind of things that it, I think the kind of equations you get are, are will have solutions modulo integers. So it's not going to be it's not going to be easy to decide whether this polynomial equation has a solution. And I think by the way, I think this is a really bad way to try to prove the Riemann hypothesis. <laughs> all right, all right. So this is all old. Th these are all old things. These, I mean, the, all these this dates for all this all these applications. Everything. This all dates. Well, actually, I guess the particular poem I had was a little bit later. But these are all from the 1970s or, or earlier. All right, so, um, so what, is, what have been people doing since then? Um, people have been looking at, at, at extensions of, of Hilbert's time problem, where you replace, instead of looking at the integers, you look at other rings. So one example would be you could try to <laughs> replace the integers by the ring of integers of some number field. So here, k is a, is a finite extension of of, of the field of rational numbers. So uh, let's see. So, so k is some finite extension of the rational. For example, you could have q adjoin q adjoin square root of minus one. And then 
And then inside such a ring, there's a natural analog of the integers, namely you take the set of the set of the set of numbers in here that satisfy a polynomial, a monic polynomial with integer coefficients. In this case, you just get the Gaussian numbers as, as an example. So, okay, so this is my example of k, and this, this would be the, the ring of integers, which I've been calling O sub k. And so now, instead of asking the question for z, you can ask the same question for one of these rings. And in number theory, these rings have very similar properties to these for the most part. I mean, there's some things that are different, like. I mean, not all of these are, are UFDs, as you probably know, but but but, there, it, the, but most of the properties are pretty similar. And so you you might expect, okay, so the natural conjecture would be then that, well, just as for z, you would expect that all these you'd have a negative answer to Hilbert's tenth problem for or for any of these rings of integers. Yeah, and just to be clear, the problem is you want to you it, the question is is there an algorithm that will take as input uh, a multivariable polynomial with coefficients in this ring, and then it will answer, you know, that's, you know, it should decide yes or no, is there a solution to that polynomial equation where the variables take values in, in that ring. Okay, so, but this is still a conjecture, it hasn't been proved yet. And the, the reason that it hasn't been, well, okay, well, I mean, why can't you just take the proof that works for z and just copy it? Um, well, there is some special property of z that's used that, that, do, that doesn't hold for an arbitrary ring of integers. And the, the proof the proof for z, it uses properties about the solutions to the Pell equation, which is the equation x squared minus dy squared equals 1, where d is some positive integer. And, well, in particular, when, yeah, if, if d is some yeah, non-square, then if you take the set of solutions to that, well, they, they form a group. That, in fact, it's essentially the elements of norm 1 in, in the, well, in, in, in the ring z adjoined squared of d. And, and, and the important thing, for the proof, it turns out, is that the rank of that group, I mean, it's a finely generated abelian group, and the, and, the, and the rank turns out to be 1. But if you, if you ask about the same, if you ask about the same equation over the ring of integers of a number field, then it's no longer, I mean, it's still a finely generated abelian group, but it's not rank 1. It'll be, the rank will depend on other things, like the number of real and imaginary places, and things like this. The number, yeah, real and imaginary embeddings of the, of the, of the number field. And for some number fields, you can't find any Torus like this, or any any generalization of this kind of equation that that has the right rank conditions, and so the so I mean there are some there are some for, I mean for z join i it turns out to be known you can the the Hilbert Hilbert tenth problem has a negative answer because you can again write down certain you can write down certain equations of this type, but for for some number fields that you can prove that there are no there are no there are no algebraic tori that have the right right rank conditions. So, okay, so, but, I mean, you can try to look at other algebraic groups then and see if, if those can give you any handle on this. And there are other algebraic groups. For example, there are elliptic curves. And, and so, there, it, so there's a conjectural approach that if you assume some sort of standard conjectures about elliptic curves over a number field, namely that, well, okay, I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to explain in detail what this, what this is about, but, um, well, okay, maybe I can say it just a, a, briefly. I mean, there's, there's something called, in number theory, something called the local global principle that applies, for example, to quadratic forms. If you have a, if you have a quadratic form and you want to know whether it has a non-trivial zero in rational numbers, maybe I can write this. So, if you have a quadratic form, and you want to, you ask the question, does it, does it, does it have a, 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 a non-trivial solution? Um, in, 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 in rational numbers, so not all, not just all the zeros, then the, the local global principle, also called the Hoss principle, says that it's, it's enough to check in, in you have to, it, to check it in each, in each completion of the rational numbers. So these are these are the fields where well one of them is where you complete with respect to the usual absolute value, you get the field of real numbers, and then you have the completions with respect to the piotic absolute values, which are the fields QP for P ranges over primes. So, so and these are and the I mean, the point of this is that these these I mean it's much easier to test whether a quadratic form has a real zero or not. 
than it is to check. And, and so it's similarly, it's, it's easier to check over these other fields than it is to check for rationalism. So this gives you a this gives you actually an algorithm for checking whether a quadratic form has has a solution of the rational numbers. And this, but this is only for quadratic forms. And if you ask the same question for higher degree equations, then they're they're known counterexamples. And in particular for elliptic curves, or not well, I guess, but not, not well, elliptic curves and really their 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 torsion things that um, genus maybe I should say cubic curves. So if you look at cubic curves, for example, cubic plane curves. Then they can they can violate this. You can there are examples where you have where you have real points, you have p-adic points for every prime p, but still there's no rational point. And the tate chow variance group is some is is some is a group is it, that that measures the obstruction of this, and it's conjecturally finite, which would be good news because that would mean that almost that there's almost a local global principle. So 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 all right. So anyway, that's some conjecture that that's been around for more than 50, more than fifty years. And, and Mazur and Rubin, they prove that if you assume this conjecture, then you can construct these elliptic curves that have very special properties, namely that, well, for, for any prime degree Galois extension, so that's a cyclic, that's a Galois Gal extension where the Galois group is cyclic, then there, if, you, if for every such pair of fields you can find an elliptic curve that has positive rank over this, Okay, maybe I should have said that the, the group of rational points in elliptic curve is also a finely generated Euler group that has some rank. And if, if the rank over that field is un, it doesn't grow when you go up to the bigger field and, and it's already positive, if you, then, well, if you have that, they, well, okay, okay, they prove that the conjecture implies that, and then I, with, uh, with Alexandra Schlafentoff, we prove that if you have, if you can construct these elliptic curves, then you can do something sort of like what Matya Savich and so and, and others did to prove the negative answer of Hilbert's time problem over the string of integers. Okay, but this is not known. It's still this is still a conjecture. It seems pretty hard. So, um, so what are you going to do in this situation? Well, you can change the problem. So, so okay. So I'm going to give up on this for now and look at a different problem. So let's look at so another natural ring that you could ask about is well, is, the, is instead of z, look at q. Look at the field of rational numbers. You can ask, is there an algorithm to decide whether a polynomial equation has a solution in rational numbers? And here again, the answer is not yet known. So you might hope that you could use a, a, some sort of reduction. I mean, given that you know that there's a negative answer for z, could you somehow do, sort of leverage that and somehow show that, that the negative answer for z implies a negative answer for q? I mean, there is a natural relation between z and q, namely rational numbers or ratios of integers. And so, but if you try to do a reduction using that relation, then it goes the wrong direction. I mean, it lets you take, if you, if you use that, you can take a, a, a polynomial equation with rational variables. You can write each rational variable as a ratio of two integer variables, and you can clear denominators, and that'll give you, that'll give you some homogeneous equation in integer variables. But that, so that, that's a way of, of taking the rash, instances of the rational problem and embedding them as instances of the rational number problem. But those instances you get, as I said, they're the homogeneous equations. And it might be that there's a special algorithm that solves those homogeneous integer equations, even if the general integer equation is not solved. So just because you can do this, this sort of transfer, it's only embedding, it's only giving you a sub-problem of, of the problem that's known to be hard. And so it could be that there's still an algorithm for, the, for these homogeneous integer equations, which is the same as as rational equations. Yeah, so maybe I could write, just write this. So Hilbert's tenth problem over, over Q is just sort of the same, is sort of the same as Hilbert's tenth problem for, well, for deciding the existence of non-trivial solutions for, for homogeneous, homogeneous equations of Q. But this is a sub-problem of the original, of the original Hilbert's tenth problem over Z. So just because we know this is hard, it doesn't mean that the special case is hard. This could be easier. And so, so this, this kind of reduction doesn't work. But there is a, 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 a well, if you knew something more, then you could, you could do a reduction in the, in, in the other direction. And what, one, thing you would, one way to do it would be as if you knew that the integers could be cut out inside the rational numbers in a diaphantine way. And I, I haven't defined this term, but you can probably guess what it means. It's the same notion as here, except now all the variables are rational numbers, and we look at rational points, and we look at the 
we want to take the set of rational numbers here for which there's a solution rational numbers and we hope that the answer to that is that the set of parameters for which the equation is solvable is exactly the integers so I mean it's maybe hard to believe I don't know maybe it's I don't know maybe, maybe, maybe it's not hard to believe I mean do, I don't know. Could, could you imagine that there's, a, there's some equation such that when you plug in rational numbers, it's solvable if and only if t is a, a rational number. Or sorry, t is solvable if and only if t is an integer. So it's solvable for integers and non-solvable when t is not an integer. Uh, what, what is the restriction on t? What does t have to do? So t, so, so t is, so the, 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 the situation is this. So we have a so we, we want to find a, a particular polynomial equation, take our polynomial with rational coefficients. So. And, and then we take the we take we plug in all possible rational numbers for t. And you ask, does there, does there exist a solution in rational numbers? And the answer will depend on what a what a is. And so you, now you take and A ranges over rational numbers. So, you, so for some rational numbers, there will exist a solution, and, and for some, there will not be. And the question is, if you choose this very carefully, does there exist a polynomial like this, such that when you look at the parameter values, the rational parameter values for which this is solvable, it's solvable exactly when the parameter value, when that rational number is an integer. So can you characterize the integers in this way as the set of parameter values for which the polynomial is solvable? So while well, this is not known, and in fact, Mazur made a conjecture that would, that would imply that, that, that there is no such way to do this. He made this conjecture, in fact, in fact especially to, to spite anybody who was trying to give a negative answer to Hilbert's term problem this way. So he, he was, so he, yeah, so I mean his conjecture, I'll, I've written it there, it's a conjecture about, the, about the, what the rational points on a, on a variety look like in the real topology. So, well, all right, let me, let me, maybe I can draw what his conjecture is about. All right, so you take a, you take a polynomial and n variables. Okay, so this is, this is a picture of R to the n. And you hit, you take a, take a hypersurface, and then you look at the, all the rational solution, all the rational points, the points where all, all the coordinates are rational, on that, on that hypersurface. So, um, well, I mean, depending on what the, what the equation is, there might not be any, any at all. For example, if you take x squared plus y squared equals 3, that's a nice circle, but there aren't any rational points on it, it turns out. So anyway, so you take the you take the set of rational points, and you take the so that's some countable set, and you take the closure of it in the usual Euclidean topology, and so well some of these might get filled in I don't know and then I mean, this could be higher dimensional as well you might have isolated points somewhere, but the conjecture is that the closure of that set of rational points has only finitely many connected components, so in particular it's conjecturing that for example it's not possible to have this, the rational points on this, they can't be an infinite discrete set of, you know, a, a line of, you know, a sequence of points tending out, going to infinity. So that's major conjecturing that that's not possible. And if you know that that's not possible, well, I mean, that implies that there's no way you're going to get, well, there's no way that you're gonna, this is going to project onto exactly the integers, because what would it have to look like if you had, if you, if you were going to get every integer as, as a projection, well, it means you would have to have some rational points above zero, some rational points above one, some rational points above two, and so on. And then when you took the closure, you'd have to have at least one connected component above each integer, and they'd be separated because there no, because there are no rational, because there no, they're not supposed to be any things in, any rational numbers in the projections between the integers. So, yeah. So, so this conjecture, yeah. In fact, this. In fact, this, this conjecture would imply, actually, that when you project the set of rational points, the projection has the, the same property, that the, the closure of the projection also should only have finally many connected components. So it can't be something like the integers. OK, so anyway, but um, we don't know the answer to Mazur's conjecture either. I mean, it's been open for, yeah, well, as you can see, for 20, what, 24 years now. I mean, it's, 
It's known for one dimension. This is known for one dimensional varieties and, and zero dimensional varieties. Um, but even for one dimensional varieties, though, it's a pretty hard theorem. I think you have to, you have to use Fulton's theorem. Um, his proof of the Mordell conjecture. What do you got the field model for? So, I, for K3 surfaces, uh, it's, it's not known for K3 surfaces. It's known for, if there's, certain, if there's certain kinds of surfaces it's known for, but I mean, you can go try to go, go through the classification of surfaces, and in some cases it's known, but a lot of cases it's not known. So, it's, it's sort of, it's, it seems pretty, I mean, it's really, I mean, another, I think another reason he made this conjecture is to just to, to show everybody like, how little we, we know about, about rational points and varieties. I mean, once you get beyond curves, and we don't even know that much about curves. So, right. so it's just kind of it's just kind of embarrassing. So for for number theorists. All right. So okay. So 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 we're stuck here again. We don't know whether this actually whether this conjecture is true or not. Um, I I I I I would probably guess that it's false, but I, I don't have a very good reason for that. All right. So let me. So actually. So what I'm going to do is to change the question again. So now what I'm going to do is is ask for a harder question. So the original. So okay. So the original Hilbert sent problem was about in, term, in logical terms. It was about asking about the truth of first order first order sentences that look like this. So here is the, I mean, the original Hilbert sense problem, the variable to be running over integers. And the question is, well, here, here's, the, here's the instance of Hilbert sense problem, where you have a polynomial equation, and you ask, do there exist integers x1 through xn that satisfy the equation? But I mean, in first order logic, this is just a very special kind of first order sentence. And you could ask, you could ask about, you could ask the harder question about the truth of more general first order sentences, where you allow not just existential quantifiers, but also universal quantifiers. And then you can also use Boolean operators to combine equations if you want. And so here's a typical first order, first order sentence. So we're, we're all, and what makes a sentence, I mean, it's a sentence in that all the, all the variables are bound by quantifiers. So this actually has a truth value when the variables run over integers. And well, I mean, you might say, oh, that's stupid. I know that that general problem is going to be un undecidable because you, already Hilbert's 10th problem was undecidable. And now you're asking for even more. You can't have an algorithm for all these if you, if you don't even have an algorithm for these. But the point of asking this question is now you can ask the same thing for rational numbers, where we don't yet know if these things, if, if Hilbert's tenth problem is undecidable. But maybe you can prove that this harder question for rational numbers is undecidable. And that turns out to be, yes, yeah, so you, can, you can prove that the harder question is undecidable. And this is actually done by Julia Robinson back in 1949. And she, what she did is, she did, she reduced to the case of the integers. And the way she did it by, was by doing essentially what we were trying to do before, where, where it get, characterize the integers inside the rational number by means of a, some polynomial equation. Except now you're not, you don't, you're, you're not restricted to just look at parameter values in a, in a, in a polynomial equation, but you can look at parameter values in a, in a more general first order formula where you have not just an equation here, but something that involves universal quantifiers and so on. And, and in fact, here's, here's an example. So it's been simplified a lot since then. And her, her formula had a lot of, in fact, actually used the local global principle for quadratic forms, in fact, as, as part of the proof. But it, it involves, it involves, okay, well, anyway, here's, here's, here's a newer version uh, um, due to me and, and, and simplified even, even more by Joachim Kernigsen. Um, so here's, here's, okay, here's a statement. So if you look at this, this is some, this is some polynomial equation, and you can ask, well, given given integers a and b, well, you can okay. Well, let me say it this way: you can ask, given a rational number t, do there exist? I mean, is it true that for all rational numbers a and b, there exist seven rational numbers that satisfy this this equation? And yeah, there it does. The answer does depend on t, because there is a t in here somewhere. And so, well, the, sometimes the answer will be yes, and sometimes the answer will be no. And it turns out that for this particular, for this particular formula, this is solvable. I mean, this this is true if and only if t is an integer, if and only if that rational number is an integer. So, okay, I'm not going to explain why that's true. It has something to do with quaternion algebras. But so, but anyway, so you, could, so but, I mean, the only annoying thing here is that it uses these these universal quantifiers. If you didn't have those universal quantifiers, 
then this would be a diphantine. This would show that Z was diphantinely definable inside Q. And then you would have had, then you would be able to get Hilbert's tenth problem over Q. But, but even though, but okay, so you don't have quite have that, but so you get something weaker, you get that the, this harder problem is indecisible. And so this is what this is what Julie Robinson was able to show. And okay, another thing, using similar ideas, uh, Kurtzman is also recently able to prove that even though it's not yet known that Z is diphantine, the complement of Z is diphantine. So what does that mean? That means that there is a polynomial equation, such that if you take all the, if it's a hypersurface, such that if you take all the rational points on the hypersurface and you project them down onto the first coordinate, you get exactly the non-integers. You get all the rational numbers that are not integers. And so it, it might sound, I mean, if you could get the integers, then, then we'd be done. We'd be, have, we'd be, we'd, we will prove Hilbert's sense theory. Prove a negative answer for Hilbert's tenth problem over Q. We got non-integers inside, and that doesn't seem to be good for anything. But, <laughs> but it, I mean, it, it's it somehow is very seems sort of close in some sense. But you, you, at least you, you, you can sort of you can characterize the non-integers inside Q. Yeah, and, you, and then this was generalized but to number fields by Stephen Devine, Jennifer Clark. All right, so. All right, so I mean, okay, so well, that's where things stand here. I mean, we're still trying to get rid of these universal quantifiers. Uh, Connie Kurnigsman, in, in the process of doing this, was able to get rid of one of them. But now, so there's just one universal quantifier le left that needs to be eliminated. And so, anyway, so we're still stuck. All right, so I'm going to change the question once more. So, all right, so now, all right, so now we're going to look at rings between Z and Q. So let me, all right, so let's, so here's the, here's, here's the question now. So, I mean, you can ask about Hilbert's tenth problem over any ring, well, any ring where you can sort of enumerate the elements, or any ring whose, whose elements you can sort of feed into a computer. So, so in particular, you can look at you have Z here, and you have field of rational numbers up here, and there are all sorts of rings in between where you would join, uh, well, you Z join half, or, you, you can, if you, if you, yeah, you can in fact, yeah, or you can, you can take all the, you can Z join one half and a third, those are all the rational numbers whose denominator is a power of two times the power of three, so you have all these subrings, and in fact, you, you can get many subrings in this way, um, in fact, they're all, they're all describable like this. So what you do is you choose any set of primes, S, and you adjoin all their inverses to Q, so you take all the, and so, okay, so you take the subring that, where you have restricted denominators, Rational numbers where the, the denominator, denominator is required to involve only the primes in S. And okay, so each of those is a subring, and you, it's pretty easy to show that those are all the subrings of Q. And so now you can ask about Hilbert's tenth problem for all of these rings in between. So down here, we know by Matusiewicz and so on that, the, that there's no algorithms for integers. Here, up, up here, for rational numbers, that, well, that's what we'd really like to know, but we don't know yet for Hilbert's tenth problem whether there is an algorithm or not. And so you can sort of ask, okay, how far up can I get and still prove a no answer? So Julia Robinson was able to prove that if you would invert finitely many primes, then the ring you get is sort of similar enough to Z that you can, that you can actually prove a no, a no answer here as well. And I mean, you can also invert infinitely many primes. You could say invert all the primes that are 1 mod 4. That's sort of half the primes. So you get 50% you get credit if you can get a, if you get a no answer for that. So, uh, so what, what I was able to do uh, recently, or not so recently anymore. Oh yeah, okay, so this is just repeating what I was just saying. So every subring is of this, of this form. So you have all these Z join S inverse, so S is any, any subset of this set of prime numbers. And yeah, so, so how large can we make S in the sense of the density of a set of primes and still prove a negative answer? And so, so Robinson was able to use this local goal principle again to to get, get a negative answer for finally, for finally many. And I know, so I was able to get 100% credit. But unfortunately, 100% does not mean all. It just means that asymptotically, the density of the set of primes I invert tends to, I mean, the, the, it's, it's, it's something that tends to one. So there's a very sparse set of primes that I haven't inverted. But I mean, it gets sparser and sparser as you go out, but it's still not. Yeah, so, I, so, it's, I, I, so I have a ring that's almost the, the, the field of rational numbers. But it's not quite. But at least over that ring, I, can, I was able to prove that 
that you can get a negative answer. So it's going to serve right under here. <laughs> but not quite up here. All right. And that, that proof uses, uses something about elliptic curves. So I, I don't think I have time to. Well, I think I, I, well, maybe I can tell you a little bit. Well, OK, maybe, I, maybe I'll skip that. I can, I, I can, uh, if, if people are interested, I can talk about that later. All right, so, okay, so here's my last slide. So just to summarize, um, well, you can ask about a Hilbert's 10th problem, or you can ask about this more general problem about the, the first order senses. So the, the theory is just the set of first order senses that are true. And you can ask, and for, for each, for either that question or the harder question, you can ask for various rings of fields whether, whether there is an algorithm or not. And so, well, okay, so here's the original Hilbert's 10th problem over Z, where you have a negative answer. And yeah, and of course, if you have a negative answer here, then you can also have a negative answer in this column. And so, well, some of these are, well, some of these are kind of silly, but, okay, well, anyway, for, like, the complex numbers, I mean, there, yes, there is an algorithm. If somebody gives you a polynomial equation, even a multivariable polynomial equation, it's pretty easy to decide whether it has a solution in complex numbers or not. You just have to make sure it's not, like, an equation like 5 equals 0 or something like that. As long as it's not something like that, then you'll have a, you'll have a, you'll have a solution. And you can also do the first order theory, because that's sort of classical elimination theory. If you have a, yeah, so... If you if you have if you, you want to know yeah okay anyway so and and similarly over the real numbers um, so Tarski found a, a, a similar uh, um, similar elimination of quantifiers but where you you use not just polynomial equations but also inequalities because I mean the, the point is that um, if you take if you take a set of, uh, that's defined by a polynomial equation over the real numbers like x squared plus y equals one. And when you're eliminating a quantifier, then geometrically what you're doing is essentially projecting onto some of the coordinates. And if you take such a, a, a real algebraic set of the real points of some algebraic variety and project, you don't necessarily get the real points of a variety anymore. You can hear you, in this example, you get something that's an interval, which is not defined by polynomial equations, but it is defined by polynomial equations and inequalities. And so, and it turns out in general that if you have any thing that's more, I mean, there's a more narrow, more general notion of a semi-algebraic set, where you take anything that's defined by polynomial equations and inequalities, and if you work in that class of sets, then it turns the Tarski proved that it's closed under under projections. And so, by using this, you can you can you can answer any of these, and you, and you can do this algorithmically. So you can you can you can find the description of the projections and so on. So you can eliminate quantifiers, and so you can you can you can easily get answers to these questions. And, okay, this is the stupidest one of all. If you look over a finite field, well, yes, you can, you can, you can, you can decide whether you play, you can just loop through all the balls of that and all these variables, so, all right. And p-i fields, they work sort of similarly to the real numbers. There's a more complicated elimination of quantifiers for them. And, well, here's a character, here's a, here's a character of p and all. Well, it is sort of this kind, this kind, yeah, this kind of, yeah, this time of the talk, so. <laughs> so, this is the wind down. So yeah. So all right. So all right. So here's yeah. So here's the question we don't have, we really like to know the answer to the Hilbert tenth problem of the Q, and this was Julia Robinson's result for Q for for, for the full first order equation of Q. And well, okay. Anyway, there are a couple other funny things that happen here for certain function. These are function fields. These are the uh, field of rational functions over the complex numbers, that there in one variable it's not known, but in two or more variables it turns out that there's enough complexity that you can, you, you can again prove a negative answer. And also what's sort of funny is that even though you, over the, for complex rational functions we don't know, if you look at real rational functions in one variable, then again it's net and no again. Okay, I don't know what all this, well anyway, so. Yeah, I've tried to sort of order these. I mean, there's no, actually there's no such thing as arithmetic <laughs> complexity. So this does, I, it just, I mean, you can maybe measure the size of a field in terms of how big its absolute value group is or something like that. And then maybe integers have more structure than rational numbers because you have the divisibility relation too, so you can define more things. But. All so right, so I think that, you also yeah. have some boxes inside this ordering. Oh, yeah, I tried to group things a little bit. Since, yeah. I mean, these are all the function field things here, or, or <laughs> function fields over R and C, and these are things that are sort of like number fields. Oh, well, these are number fields. And global function fields, function fields over finite fields are analogous to number fields. And yeah, okay, these are local fields here. And well, okay, yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it doesn't mean too much. Okay. 
All right, so thank you. So uh, let me end here. So thank you for your attention. like the integers. And when I say, say it's essentially like, I mean sort of approximately the integers. Like, there's going to be some point whose who's y coordinate is approximately 1. Not exactly 1, but there'll be a point here that's like this, and there'll be another point whose y coordinate is approximately 2. And, and so on. And so in this way, I can make it so that when I take this set of points and project onto the y coordinate, I can get something that, not really the integers, but sort of like a wiggled, like a, a perturbed version of the integers. And then you can define on that copy of the of the almost integers. You can define an addition and multiplication. You define one point plus another point to equal a third point if a plus b is within one tenth of c. And then you in that you can turn it into a polynomial equation. And so you can define addition and multiplication. You can assume you can you can you can sort of model a copy of the in, of the integers inside of the, in the inside of this integer points of the curve. And so, but it's a little bit complicated to say what S is because you need to know what the denominators of the rational coordinates of all these points are. And so it's by looking at, at, at those. And, okay, so maybe that's, maybe that's enough. Okay, any other question? Okay, if not, let's find it.